Okay, well, I was just having a little discussion with the class that um, if you have any preferences, like if you feel like the I tried writing on the chalk part last time, so we're experimenting with this. This is like experimental media. It sort of sounds like, like some kind of art class. Or something. Okay? Um, but uh, if, if the um, uh, blackboard, if you don't like the blackboard, send me an email. Or if you, um, uh, you know, if you have any preferences, or if there's something that's hard to hear, I think I have. Oh, I forgot to turn this on. Uh -oh. A little light bulb's not coming on. That's not good. Uh, please turn it off. I definitely forgot to turn it off. Hold on. Um, and there's no batteries in here. I'm having the feeling that this isn't doing anything. Okay. Please turn off. Um, probably it's my fault. Um, I'm, I'm expecting this isn't doing anything because the light's not coming on. Okay. Um, uh, there's no way, uh, Josh, but you can tell me if this is working, right? Okay, anyway, um, I guess there's no harm in leaving it on. It's not doing anything, probably. Um, but if you have any preferences in terms of media, I guess what I'll do is I'll try to speak up. Um, I think that this microphone here picks up my audio and so does uh, the one over there, okay? Uh, maybe it actually makes sense to put this close. Okay. All right. Okay, so today we're going to pick up on the uh, material uh, on the Bayesian estimation. So last time we did frequency estimation and this time we're doing Bayesian estimation. And uh, so, uh, so let me uh, pick up with that. So the key idea here is that um, so uh, the um, so the idea is this that you have uh, in the Bayesian framework uh, in the Bayesian framework that's a little hard to read. Um, I'll write a little bit. That what happens is that um, you have y, this is the observation, okay, and x, this is the unknown, okay, and um, I don't know if there's a way of raising the contrast. Well, um, uh, but this thing here in the Bayesian framework is a random variable. So in the frequency frame, framework, if you recall, theta was a was the unknown, and it was a parameter, so it was uh, a number. But that was not this framework, okay? So, so here we're not we're not going to have that, okay? But I just wanted to contrast it with the data remember. So um, now what happens is then you have x hat is going to be some function of x, okay? Oh, I'm sorry, of y. And the hope is that uh, x hat will be close to to x, okay? And um, uh, so the way you do that then is that um, uh, in the general case in a Bayesian framework, you define some sort of cost function, okay, which uh, here is uh, that you have uh, for each, so let's say x was the true value of the variable you were estimating, and then you guess x hat, which is really t of y, right, then uh, this is the cost. So you want to minimize the cost. So what you really want is the minimum risk. So the risk is like is the expected value of this quantity. Now since these are random variables, you can take the expectation. Am I going off the board? No. So your objective then is to find p that minimizes this. That's the way it goes. 
So T is the thing you can actually choose, because it's the function you can apply to the data that gives you the estimate. And you want to pick T to minimize this. Now, um, there's a few different possibilities uh, if, if, um, if, uh, if the cost, so I'll put here x hat, so this is the thing you're trying to estimate, and that's the, the estimate, okay, those are two different things. Um, if this thing is going to be the squared error, okay, then it, then it turns out, and I think this is a homework problem, that the best solution is always that um, P of Y is going to be the conditional expectation, uh, I'll put an error here, it doesn't have to be, but the optimal solution in this case is always the conditional expectation of X given Y. So the conditional expectation is what's called the minimum mean square error estimate. So among all estimators, it's the one that produces the minimum, minimize the expected mean square error, okay? Is the, is the um, mean square error an unbiased estimator? Well, first of all, the concept of unbiasedness is a little bit funky in this context because unbiasedness is really a frequentist concept, okay? So when you translate it over to the Bayesian framework, you know, it's maybe open to interpretation a bit, okay? But the way I would interpret it is I would say, well, the unbiased estimator would mean that that you'd say that if you know, okay, so if, if you look at the conditional expectation of the estimate x, given the known value x, the question is, 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 uh, is that going to be equal to x? And the answer is usually no. The Bayesian estimate is usually biased, right? Um, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, probably a better way of thinking about this, you know, when you're thinking about conditional expectation, the way you tend to really think about it isn't really quite the rigorous way. It's sort of like the way, it's sort of the mechanical way, is that you really think about the function. See, the conditional expectation is a random variable, okay? But the way to think about it is it's the random variable which you can produce by calculating this function and applying this function, okay, to, uh, if you calculate the function and you plug the random variable, oops, this isn't supposed to be x, this is supposed to be y, I'm trying to confuse you. So you plug the function, you plug the, usually the way you think about conditional expectations, is you calculate the function that you would, you would plug the random variable y into, in order to generate. See, the conditional expectation is a random variable, okay? But the, uh, but the way you usually calculate it, I mean, how do you calculate the conditional random variable, uh, conditional, um, co conditional expectation? Well, in principle, you have to calculate a random variable, okay, whatever that means. But in practice, what you really do is find this function, okay, so that when you plug the, the conditioning random variable in, you get the desired random variable, okay? So mostly we tend to think of the conditional expectation. Engineers tend to think of this as a conditional expectation, that function, okay? That's sort of operationally what you need to actually calculate. So, uh, so what we're really asking is if this function uh, is equal to x, right? And, uh, hold on, am I confusing the thing? Uh, uh, oh no, I can oh, I'm, I made two corrections. This is why I should never correct anything in the board without looking at my notes. Because, okay, this was supposed to be X. Okay. We are conditioning on X here. So we're looking at, this is a little confusing and I'm making it worse. <laughs> the, 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 uh, the estimate X hat is a function of Y data. So for any particular value of x, is its expected value going to be x? The answer is mostly no. Okay? And the reason is we're going to have bias. And I'll, I'll show you why in just a minute. Okay? Um, so, but there are other estimates, if other risk estimates, another possibility is that you can have, um, I'm going to uh, erase this.
you could have um, the absolute value of x minus x hat. Okay? If you have the absolute value, then the, then the uh, minimum risk estimate is not the conditional expectation, but it actually it, it's what's the uh, it's the conditional median. Okay? So in that case, it's uh, I'll let you, you do it as a homework problem, but it's the um, basically what you do is it's median of the conditional distribution of x given uh, given y. So that's the optimal solution, and I can write that as t. Am I going off the board? No, okay. Uh, t of y. So that's the optimal estimator. Okay. Um, and uh, we'll consider others. The other one that we'll actually consider quite a bit in this class. Okay. So you got this. Okay, you're going to do this as a homework problem. So when you do this as a homework problem, you'll hopefully understand it. Basically, you look at the posterior, this is called the posterior distribution, we're going to talk about it in a little bit. And you look at the median of the posterior, the median of the posterior is the, is the minimum mean square error estimator. The median of the posterior is going to be uh, minimized as the uh, absolute error and um, in a scalar case. In a vector fit case, things are more complicated. And, uh, and uh, the, the other thing we're going to talk about is the map estimate. Okay. If the quantity you're estimating is discrete, okay, then you can have this case. Uh, so this is the so-called uh, <coughs> so this is equal to um, uh, one if x is not equal to x hat, and it's equal to zero if x equals x hat. That's a like very um, extreme situation, okay? That's like sort of the lottery, right? It says, okay, well, I bought my Powerball ticket for a buck, and I'm either extraordinarily happy or not happy, okay? I mean, you buy your, you know, either like you get very lucky, and every digit matches, and you, you, you've now won $100 million or whatever the pot is, a billion dollars. What is the last Powerball pot? I mean, it's probably like really extraordinary. Did you ever see that movie, um, uh, what's him call it, uh, the guy, Austin Powers, uh, what's the uh, guy? It's really, my personal favorite character is Dr. Evil, okay? And did you ever see where he goes, he's a, uh, uh, he, he goes, you know, if I'm going to blow up the world unless you give me one million dollars, right? No, it doesn't seem like that much money. Okay, anyway, um, getting back to the theme of this course, um, uh, let's see. So this is kind of extreme, okay? Because you're either like exactly right or no one cares, okay? In practice, usually close is a whole lot better than really far off, okay? So this is a really bad, this is a really bad cost function, right? So it's, so it's like really a horrible cost function, right? Maybe it's good for like binary transmission. Yeah, might be binary transmission. For most things, it's really bad, right? But even though it's really bad, it's what we'll do most of the time. Okay? So as engineers, we'll do the thing that's worse most. And we'll find that the that this worst the worst choice actually um, is still really hard to do in most cases and uh, is a whole lot better than the alternatives. Okay? So what people are doing today usually is far worse than this, and this is bad, okay? So this is like a huge improvement. But someday, when computers are a million times faster than they are today, maybe we'll want to do the other thing. Okay? Now, uh, you're going to talk about, you're going to do this as a homework problem. Okay, now, okay, so this thing is called the map okay, estimate. Okay? It's the map estimate. So, now, first, I just want to introduce the idea that there are different kinds of estimators. Okay? Uh, so, uh, mostly we're only going to talk about the map estimate. So, uh, for that reason, it's easy at the end of the course to forget there are other estimators, and to forget that those estimators could actually be a lot better, okay? But I just want to plant that seed in your mind, because uh, in your career, we'll probably be, there'll be a lot more interest in the future in other estimators, okay? But this course will mostly focus on the simplest of estimators, so let me go back and, um, and uh, talk about that a little bit.
So you have the MAP estimate. This is the maximum A posteriori estimate. MAP estimate, okay? And the way it works is like this. You say, okay, it's easy enough to show that the solution to that cost function I just wrote down, the MAP estimate, the, the value is, is, uh, is the function x hat, which is equal to the R uh, max over x, okay, of the conditional probability of x being y. Okay, so this is the function p of y, which produces the best result. Is that big enough that you can see it? Uh, I could do the tablet, but I just, okay, maybe it's my own personal failing, but I, I feel like, I feel more connected to you guys, you know? <laughs> I feel more in touch, you know? When I'm at the blackboard, okay, because I can, like, look at you, okay? You know, the document camera is a little impersonal. But if you don't like this, let me know via email, and I'll switch back to the document camera. Okay? Yeah, question? Isn't that pretty much like the same as the maximum black estimate? Um, no, but very good question, okay? So it's not, because the maximum likelihood cost estimate is contrasted. In the maximum likelihood estimate, you have the probability of y given theta, okay? And remember, theta is playing the role of x, right? And you have the R max over theta of theta hat. So that's the ML. This is the ML. And this is the math. Okay? So what's different is that this is reverse. This is the conditional and, and very often uh, you know with the, the the ML estimate is really interesting in that the, the very often people will say they confuse the likelihood with the probability. The likelihood is really not the probability because the likelihood is the probability of the observations as a function of theta. See, it's not the probability of theta, it's the likelihood of theta. Because it's a function of theta, but theta is not the argument of the probability distribution. But so it's very, but we don't know that, but we still very clear and give y constant. And here y is like given and we vary x2, so that's good. Yes. So, in, you know, the way to think about this usually now, the thing you put in here is really a random variable, but you usually think about it in terms of the functional relationship. So, I usually think about y as being a constant. Because you ran the experiment, you have the data, and you want to estimate the parameter. Once the experiment's done, y now is a constant, right? So, so here that's a constant. So, this isn't a probability with theta, because if I integrate theta, it doesn't integrate to 1 necessarily. This is not a probability density, but this is a probability density in X. Okay. So it's a subtle thing and very important, okay? Right. Now, um, this is exactly the kind of thing I want to discuss in lecture, which is why you must read the notes, right? Because I'm not going over the details and you wouldn't even understand what that question was if you hadn't read the notes first, right? So. Um, and I know you're all kind of like deep in your hearts you're pretty honest people because you're kind of looking to the side a little bit. You know, you know, because not everybody read all the notes as carefully as they should, okay? I can see some of the people looking down, okay? So we're okay, we're gonna do this one more time. I pledge. I pledge. I, I, I to read the notes, read the notes. Obediently, obediently before the next class. Before before the next class. class. Okay, good. Okay. Now, we're going to keep doing that. Okay. So find some time, like schedule some time. Read the notes. They're not that bad, I don't think. Okay? You can read them in a group too if you want, but I think it's better if you like probably do it silently on your own. Um, Okay, now, okay, but then what's the relationship between the map and the maximum likelihood? Well, it turns out you can do some simple manipulations here, okay? 
So, okay, well, first of all, let's just philosophically look at this a little bit, because it is important. That what happens is that you're picking the value of x, which is most probable given y. Seems like a good thing, okay? But, even though it seems like a good thing, we know it's not perfect, because look at the cost function. It's minimizing. It's minimizing a kind of ridiculous cost function. It's minimizing an all or nothing cost function. And one of the Palmer problems asks you to give a counterexample where the uh, map estimate is bad, okay? So if I ask you to prove that something's bad, what does that mean? Well, you mean, it means you have to show, according to some reasonable measure of goodness, it's asymptotically infinitely bad, okay? Because otherwise, if it's just bad, anybody could come along and say, well, I think that's good, okay? It has to be like, you have to show it's bad in the sense that any reasonable person would have to agree that it's bad, okay? So the way you could do that, actually, I'll give you, of course, the answer to the question. So the answer to the question, actually, I can actually, I can write all the way over to here, right? So the answer to the question is this. You produce, what you do is this. You generate a Gaussian distribution, okay? Okay. And now what you do is the Gaussian distribution is centered about zero, say, with variance one. So, and, and the Gaussian distribution has probability one minus epsilon, okay? And now what you can do is over here, you put a tiny little blip, okay? Okay, you put a tiny little blip, and the total area on that blip is epsilon. But the height of the blip, say, increases as 1 over epsilon, okay? So this, say, is, is 1 over epsilon, which means the width of the blip, say, decreases as epsilon squared, okay? So you make this thing get out, and then the center, okay? So the center here increase, it, it, is at 1 over epsilon. Okay? So as that point gets small, this little blip gets further and further away, and it gets taller and taller and taller, and the area, but the area on the right gets smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So what will happen is that as uh, epsilon goes to zero, the map estimate, what's the map estimate here? With the, this is the conditional probability of x given y, okay? So in this, we have a special case where uh, the conditional probability doesn't depend on the data, okay? Okay, y is, y is zero, okay? I, I don't know. So, what happens is that the map estimate will go to infinity, right? Because the map estimate will always be this peak. Even though this is just an infinitesimal amount of probability, it'll grab that peak because it's the highest probability, okay? But this isn't probability, this is probability density, right? And so the problem is it's becoming very, very thin, but it's tall. So it grabs the solution. But what's the expected value? Zero, right? So you're getting infinitely bad solution, okay? So this is a counterexample to the idea that the map estimate is good. The map, the map estimate has problems, okay? But that said, uh, we're going to use it, okay? So, uh, so what happens here is this is the R max over x uh, of, the, of the log of t of x given y. I'm going to actually do this in steps because it's, it's very important. Oh, okay. I'll do it in different steps. Okay. So the conditional probability of x given y by Bayes' rule is the conditional probability of y given x and the probability of x over the probability of y. Right? Yeah. Um, can we use the same argument um, to say that the maximum likelihood estimate um, suffers from the same thing as well? Um, no. Why? Because that one is also looking at. No, because the maximum likelihood estimate is asymptotically efficient, okay? So. Um, but it's also looking at the density as well. I guess this, this is a very good question. I've got to think about it. But. Um, but that can't happen for the maximum likelihood estimate because, well, I'll have to think about it, okay? But, um, 
it can't happen under the standard assumptions of when you would use the maximalized good estimate. So the maximalized good estimate always comes up in sequences perspective, okay? And there, the standard way of doing it is that you have independent observation, uh, independent random variable, independent observations from some distribution, a common distribution. And in that case, you can't have this pathological thing occur, okay? Um, because we know, oh, okay, there are some constraints on that theorem, by the way, that the uh, support. This doesn't violate the assumptions of the theorem. So, uh, so this pathological case can occur. But, um, uh, and if you make the same assumption in the map estimate, the same pathological case can occur. But the map estimate is, um, okay, the problem with the map estimate is this, that, um, This this problem occurs due to your essentially due to what we're going to describe as the as the adoption of the prior and and in in the maximum legacy estimate there is no adoption of the prior that was a very vague answer to your question okay so I don't want to pretend that I gave you a rock solid solution okay okay but but it's a good question and I have to think about it part of it is the formulation of the question itself because your question probably admitted vague that's not a criticism. But I think if you make the question precise, then um, it always has a precise answer, which essentially eliminates the possibility of this kind of nasty thing happening in the maximum like an estimate. But it's a very good question, okay? But the underlying issue is this, that the maximum like an estimate is sensitive to events that it doesn't care about the topology of the solution, right? It, it, if there's one probability that is very likely, but it's surrounded by other things that are very unlikely, then it can still be selected. Okay, so it's um, you might say it's too aggressive. Okay, it may be an informal way of thinking about it. We'll see later on in the class like where it'll behave badly sometimes. Okay. Um, okay, so it's a very good question, but it shows that you're really thinking. Okay, so. Um, so this, I can rewrite this probability using, this is Bayesville, okay? Now the key issue here, and this is something we'll be doing a lot, is that we're looking at a maximum with respect to x. But x, but this, this function is not a, okay, p of y in the denominator of this expression is not a function of x. So we can basically drop it. Because any, any, anything that, any multiplying constant, which is not a function of the thing we're, we're, um, we're minimizing with respect to or maximizing with respect to, we can always drop, okay? So I can basically drop that term, okay? So, and then I can also take the log, because uh, the, the log is a monotone increasing function, so if I maximize the log, it's the same thing as maximizing the function, okay? So if I take the log, the product becomes a sum, so then I have the log, I have the log of p of y gives x plus the log of p of x, right? And um, so what we're really trying to do is we're trying to maximize the sum of the two terms. So the ma this first term looks like the maximum. If I drop the, this thing is called the prior term. And this is the uh, data term. So the data term, if I drop the prior term, if p of x is not a function of x, so let's say that, for instance, x is full on an interval 0 to 1, and it's uniformly distributed on that interval, then, then the log of the prior will be a constant. Effectively, it doesn't depend on x. That term would drop out, and then I just have the maximum likelihood estimate. So the, the difference between the maximum likelihood estimate and the map estimate is I have two terms. One says I should fit the data. I should pick x that makes the observations probable. But the other one is I says I, I should pick the x which also fits my my uh, my uh, model or my assumptions about what the distribution of x is. So if I'm reconstructing an image or I'm forming an image from from data, okay, of course nobody in this room knows. Uh, remembers what snow looks like on the TV, I guess, because you were all born digital, right? Um, but, you know, in the old days, TVs, had, TVs generated lots of noise. It was like, you know, you had a TV that looked like this, and it had sort of this round tube thing, and then it had these 
rabbit ear antennas on the top, right? And then what happened was that it was like the picture was kind of a lot, especially if you tuned the channel where there was no signal. You would just get, okay? And, um, and then you'd hold the antenna and you'd kind of go like this and try to get it to receive and stuff like that, but it really didn't work very well. But anyway, uh, you would get this snowy picture, okay? Now, what's the problem? Oh, uh, no, okay. What's the probability that, um, and this is where, this is going to be really hard for me because it requires that I actually know something about popular culture, which is not a strength for me, okay? Uh, name a figure, a popular culture figure on TV. Does anybody know any popular culture figures in TV? Oh gosh, you guys, we, have, we need a remedial course on American pop culture, okay? Yeah. Who? Oprah. Did you say Oprah? Okay, Oprah, good. So <laughs> what's the chances that you're going to have snow on the TV and it's going to suddenly look like a picture of Oprah having a conversation with someone? Very small, but not zero, okay? Not zero. It might be like 10 to the minus, I don't know, uh, a lot more than that, probably. 10 to the minus, mm, that's a continuous sign of right? Well, 10 to the minus million or something, huh? I guess if you do think about it. Yeah, you'd have to do something, you'd just retize the image, okay? And then under the assumption that a reasonable person might think it's like, you know, because you could see like clouds in the sky and think they look like Oprah too, right? But it has to like look like a picture of Oprah, okay? So it's pretty small, right? So I make the following claim, that in the space of all images, a picture of Oprah having a conversation with someone is a very small subset with a very small probability, okay? That's what this thing is, okay? So what ends up happening is, if you're looking for images represent a very small subspace in the space of all things, all objects of dimension one million where it's a megapixel image, okay? So you want to include that information. You don't just want to create something that looks crazy and say, here's my picture of Oprah, it just looks like white snow. No, it better look like some sort of picture of Oprah, okay? So, okay, now the problem is this. When you introduce this term, okay, now you're not just using the data, you're using some assumptions about what the world is like. And then you bias the estimate, okay? Because if it just so happened, that Oprah had a bad hair day, okay? And Oprah really looked like snow. <laughs> you would have kind of tried to make Oprah look like Oprah, okay? So you will introduce bias, okay? But the cost of the price, so the price is bias, but the payoff is lower variance, okay? Now, okay, so now let me do uh, uh, a quick uh, example, okay? Um, and oh, so you absolutely must go through pages 20 and 21 and do this carefully because this is a very important calculation. The reason it's included in here is because, and it's actually a homework problem, so you have to do it anyway. So you look at this page and reproduce this. And the reason you want to reproduce this is there's some tricks that I use in this calculation. And first you want to do them in the scalar case because we're going to use the same tricks in the vector case. If you understand it in the scalar case first. You must understand this, let me repeat this, okay? You must understand this trick, because we're going to use this trick a lot through the class, and if you don't go through and understand it, you'll have missed something very important, and it's very hard for me to explain it, okay? Because, uh, here, I'll go to the document camera. This is an example where the document camera can be helpful. Okay, I'll just go through this. Okay, I I'm not going to kind of go through it uh, one step at a time, but at least uh, you'll see the basic idea, okay? So, uh, so here's the example. So example 2.6. So you have, um, you have X, okay? And, um, you have X, okay? Uh, X is the unknown, Y is the observation, and, and, and a simple model is that y is given by x plus some white noise, okay? And these are all random variables, 
Okay, and X is Gaussian, and, and W is an independent Gaussian, and the variance of, uh, the mean of W is zero, and the variance is sigma squared of W, and the variance of X is sigma X of W, okay, and its mean is zero, okay? So now I can write down, and I can apply Bayes' rule. Now I can write down the probability distribution. This is a Gaussian random variable. I know how to write the probability distribution down, okay? So what I want to do is, Oh, I'm uh, missing a page. What happened here? This is 20. Uh oh. What happened? 17, 18, 20. I'll get on the back. Uh, hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, it's got out of order. I lost one. I couldn't lost one. This is an evil plot by the printer. Come on. Okay, I'm not saying that. Oh, okay. That's really weird. I lost my page. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Okay. So, okay, so... So we want to calculate the conditional distribution of x given y. So the key issue here to realize is that the conditional distribution of x given y, that's the thing we have to maximize with respect to x in order to get the map estimate, is the joint distribution of the two times some constant, which is a function of, of, um, of y, okay? But we don't care about any function of y because we're only maximizing this thing with respect to x. So, we'll, so we're just going to manipulate this expression here, okay? And we're going to look at its functional dependence on x. And when we're all finished, we'll have something which is equal to the conditional distribution of x given y within a multiplicative constant. But since we know this is a Gaussian distribution, we know uh, what the multiplicative constant has to be because we know what the, multi the correct multiplicative constant for normalization of the Gaussian distribution is. This has to integrate to 1, okay? There'll be a valid probability that density with x. So finding that constant is easy in there, okay? But if you start off by trying to do the correct calculation all the way through, you'll get bogged down. So you drop the terms you don't care about. That's the key issue. Okay, so now this is the, this is the distribution for x, okay? This is the distribution for y given x. The form of this may not be completely obvious to you. What it's basically saying is that the mean of y is x, okay? And it's the variance about that mean is sigma squared sub w, because that's the noise, okay? So if this is an obvious, think about it and work it out, okay? Then what happens is that, so now I know that this probability, this conditional, the posterior, this is called the posterior probability, okay? Um, this is called the prior probability, because it's the assumed prior distribution. And that doesn't have a name, but I sometimes call it the system model. Okay. Now, um, so now if I, if this thing has to be the product of those two by Bayes' rule, or by the definition of conditional probability. And then that means I just, these are exponential terms, so I, when I multiply them together, I add the exponents, right? So that's what I get. I add the two exponents, right? Now, um, so now I know that this thing is just a quadratic function of, of x because it's the sum of quadratic functions of x. And I know that any quadratic function of x has the following form, a times x minus b squared. This is completing the square from high school, okay? So um, uh, now all I have to do is solve for a and b. So I can solve for a and b by just taking some derivatives and setting things equal, equal and just, I have to be able to find the expression for a and b in terms of the parameters of this thing, right? So now, um, now what happens is that, okay, um, okay, this is the next page. So now, I, this just shows I differentiate the expressions. I won't go through this. You can go through this. When I'm all finished, it turns out that A is this and B is that, okay? Actually, B is relatively obvious because, um, or A is relatively obvious because A has to be all the, you know, uh, what else, the second derivative of this expression with respect to X is, is, is two, okay? So, so uh, it's just got to be the sum of these two coefficients. I'll let you go through it, okay? 
So this is what A is, okay? That's what B is. When you plug in then, uh, this is the posterior distribution, right? Where, now, this is the conditional mean of the posterior distribution. The mean of the posterior distribution is only a function of, is a function of y. It's a linear function of y. And the uh, variance, this is actually very interesting. The variance of the conditional, of the posterior distribution, right, is not a function of the data. It's an interesting concept. Okay, it means that if I like estimate, so what it means is that I have an observation y, okay, and from y I'm going to compute some function of y to estimate x, right? Okay, okay, it means that, um, okay, it means that the, the, uh, the, best, the conditional distribution of x given y, right, the mean of that expression is a function of, of of y. So the conditional expectation of x given y uh, is a function of y, right? In this case, it's some constant times y, okay? But that the variance is just a constant. This is c1 and that's c2. That's a property of Gaussian random variables. For other random variables, it's not true, right? If you observe the data, okay? Uh, like, okay, so in the stock market, right, you'll hear people say the stock market has been volatile lately, okay? Okay. So, well, you know, I wouldn't be able to, that's the proof that it's not Gaussian, if you could say that. Because if I've seen the past and it tells me how much F, what the variance of is going to be in the future, it means that, that it can't be Gaussian. Because for a Gaussian random process, the future, the variance of something, of the future is not a function of the past, okay? But the value, the mean of the future might be a function of the past. So that's particularly the Gaussian random variable. Okay, so, uh, so this is what happens. Now, um, so now the conditional mean of x given y is, is this, okay? okay? Now this is really interesting, because what it says is that, okay, let's say the noise w is small compared to the uh, variance of x, okay? So, so, um, that, uh, so in other words, the other way of putting that, let's say the, the, the prior, your prior knowledge of the random variable x, its variance is large, okay? Then it means that, that um, uh, this correct. Yes, it's got to be correct because I do this all the time and, uh, okay. But the, yeah, so oh, that's right. If, if sigma x is large, then, then this is just going to be sigma x over sigma x, which is 1. So as the variance of, of the posterior is, of the prior is large, your estimate of x is just y. So, okay? Now, but now if the variance, if your posterior, if your prior distribution has small variance, then it says, well, if I know that x should be between uh, minus 1 and 1, and I get an observation for y of 1,000, I'm like, hmm. I don't really believe that, okay? I guess it's possible, but it's unlikely. So instead, I'm going to just say, hey, it can't really have been a thousand, but maybe it was one, okay? <laughs> so I attenuate it, okay? So if the a variance of the, of the prior is small compared to the noise, then I attenuate it. Essentially, I like to say, if you're only listening to the radio, and it's very, very noisy, there's a lot of static, you can't turn the game down, okay? But that biases your estimate. So this, so you have a biased estimate. So here you see that the conditional expectation of the estimate, of the minimum square error estimate, is really some number less than 1 times x, which is biased. Because these would have to be equal for this to be an unbiased estimate. So the Bayesian estimate tends to be biased, okay, but the advantage of the biased estimate is that you get lower variance, okay? Now, uh, then we can extend, extend this to the vector case. I'm going to let you look at the vector case because it gets a little complicated, but the basic concept is the same. Okay, and the way you go about doing it, again, is by completing the square. You see, I do this completing the square thing. I'll let you figure it out, okay? You have to, it's, a little, it's messy, okay? But, but, it's, but you do it, okay? And, and then what happens is that the conditional mean and the conditional variance this becomes the conditional mean, and the conditional variance is what? This is 22, 20, oh, that's the conditional mean, 
That's the conditional mean. So it's R sub X inverse plus R sub W inverse. And then you take the inverse of that quantity and then multiply it by R sub W inverse of 1. Okay? And the conditional variance now is the, co is the covariance, the conditional covariance, R sub X given Y. And that also has an expression. Okay. So you can do this. Now, then the question is, well, how does the maximum likelihood in the Bayesian estimator compare? Well, I've already kind of talked about that, and I go through some examples here. Um, okay, so uh, for this, I'm going to just draw something on the board, okay? So you're going to read this section, right? You're going to read this section, and you're going to really understand it thoroughly and so forth, okay? Okay, so we're going to go back to the blackboard. Okay, so what we're going to do is, I'm going to, because I only have a few minutes, so I'm going to explain now what the difference is between the Bayesian estimate and, and the frequency in the ML estimate, okay? <coughs> so you're going to read the notes, which are going to give you a precise formal comparison, okay? And up here, I'm going to just say things that are kind of informal, you know, a little bit, so I won't say that they're a little bit wrong, okay? But, you know, I'm oversimplifying, okay? So over here, for the purposes of making the concept clear, okay? So in the ML estimate, right, you have some points, right? So maybe you have a secret, you have a random, you have a random prop, you have a, you have some points, okay? That you measure in a signal. Okay? Now, if you're going to take the ML estimate, right, and you assume that each point is independent, well, what's the ML estimate? The ML estimate is just that x equals y. You say, well, what's your best guess at the, at the true signal? That, well, the best guess at the true signal is that whatever I measure, okay? Well, when I measure a very noisy signal, yeah, but I don't know. There's nothing else I can do, okay? That's the most probable thing, okay? That's the thing that maximizes the likelihood. You can go through and show it's true. So you're going to do exactly the thing that your physics professor told you not to do when you're or your physics teacher told you not to, you're going to just connect the dots, okay? And they're going to say, well, do you really believe that? Yes, I believe, okay? This is like when Steve Martin used to say, I believe that no pig or other farm animals should be stretched beyond its normal limit, right? So it's like, this is just goofy, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm entertaining myself. So this is what happens. You say, I don't really believe that. What I really believe is that this thing must look like this, okay? <laughs> because the signal was probably smooth and I had a lot of noise. So I'm just going to smooth it out, okay? The smoothing introduces bias, but it lowers the variance, okay? So this is the art and the beauty of the Bayesian approach. Yes, so you have to balance these trade-offs, but there's a lot of potential payoff, okay? And that's what is in this, um, that's what is in these plot, these things here. I just actually worked out an example of these plots. That's what happens if you just do the maximum likelihood estimate. It's ridiculous, okay? And that's what happens if you did the Bayesian estimate, okay? Because you model the distribution of the things you haven't observed, okay? And uh, so that's basically the idea. And uh, uh, let me see. Is this going to come back? Hello? I want to be on TV right before. I want to be on TV. No. Um, okay, there I am. Okay, yeah. Do you have a question? Yes, well, why don't we use a sample as running a sample average for the maximum likelihood estimate? Well, that would be one possibility. Oh, no, but that wouldn't be the maximum likelihood estimate. I guess it depends how we model the thing, but if we assume that they are independent and we are observing the same thing, we can use a sample average. But the if your basic assumption, and I only have 10 seconds, is that the samples are independent, okay? Mm -hmm. That they're just, that this is theta, okay? Theta 1. Data n, where that's, and then the maximum likelihood estimate, we're done, mm -hmm. <laughs> is, uh, is exactly connecting the dots, okay? So, my point is, is that in this context, the maximum likelihood estimate is unreasonable, okay? So, um, notice I waited until the camera was off. Okay. <laughs> now, then what they do is they fix up the maximum likelihood estimate. They say, well, we'll have to penalize. Maximum likelihood. Okay. You know, well, what is that? Okay. Well, I mean, I think it's a bit of a fuss. Okay, myself. Okay, but others would disagree. Okay, it depends on what your belief system is. 
okay? But, but, uh, but yeah, so they, and, and the frequencies have ways of fixing things up, okay? But if you take it in their purest form, yeah, it's just, it's, it's you know, the frequencies view is that you only use the observations without any prior assumptions. Well, that's okay, but you might not be able to get really far. 